In that, we have two sets of producers. This side of the room are uh, deer hunters, and this side of the room are beaver hunters. Each one of them makes their own tools or gets tools from a third set of people who make beaver traps and bows and arrows. So the price of a commodity will depend on how much you have to pay for your tools plus how much uh, labor time you put into, I'm sorry, let me not say that right. The, the total labor time in a commodity will depend on the labor time required to produce the uh, beaver trap and the labor time required to catch a beaver. Direct and indirectly for per beaver, that's your labor time. For uh, deer hunters, there's a labor time required to produce bows and arrows and the labor time required to use the bows and arrows to catch a deer. You average the number of deers, average the number of beavers, and you get an average labor time. Everybody got me there? Now, Smith's point is the following. If these two sets of hunters charge different prices, let's say they get away with different prices, so that here the price is high enough so the income of beaver uh, trappers is uh, 10 pounds uh, in a week, and the income of deer trappers is only 8 pounds in a week. They're both spending eight hours of labor time. Uh, and we can always uh, partition it out so that the total amount of labor time is the same. So in that situation, they have different amounts of income from the same hours of living labor. And the same thing for the producers of the raw materials, of the tools. They also sell their tools and they get a certain income. His point is that if the incomes are different, Notice I'm not saying wages, because these are not workers, they're producers, but they own their own product, so they are self-employed, they are free labor. If the wages are higher, if the income is higher, here rather than there, then some people who make deer are going to quit that and join beaver production. They can make more money that way. Same thing for one of the sets of tools. If those are different, they'll move from one type of production to another. Therefore you will end up with, according to Smith's mythic anthropology, competition will produce a division of labor in which equal quantities of labor, directly and indirectly, uh, directly first, but because indirectly is also part of somebody's direct labor, in which equal quantities of labor will earn equal incomes. Now, if that is the case, one can show formally that the relative prices of any set of goods be proportional to the direct and indirect labor time for them. And you can sort of intuitively see why. If every labor time earns the same income, then the price is the sum of the labor times, uh, the price of the sum of the incomes, which is proportional to labor time. So the price of this to the price of that will be in proportion to the labor times. Okay? And we'll show this, I'll show this formally. It's, it's uh, fairly straightforward. But it was already intuitively clear to Smith that this is a result that will follow as long as there's competition so that people can go from low income activities to high income activities, thereby bringing the price down here and bringing the income down here, bringing the price up at the other side and bringing the income up until the income is the same. Well, if every hour of labor gets the same income then the, through a given price, then the prices have to be proportional to the amount of labor. You see that? Okay, so this is very central because in this rude and early state, the law of exchange is that commodities exchange in proportion to their direct and indirect labor time. Is it not because they should, not because it is just, but because it is the result of the invisible hand of competition. This is the classical simple labor theory of value meaning of exchange value. But notice that it is not because he says that they should get it. It's a result that competition enforces. It's a result of the invisible hand.
Then Smith comes to um, a very critical point, which is that he says, now let's consider that we bring capitalist production into the story. And let's suppose that stock has accumulated, or land later on. He says, well, then the capitalists could cut themselves in for a portion of the income that was previously going entirely to the producers. Because they could say, and he says, they have a right. You've been using my machines. I, now you're, he switches over. Now you're employed to, for, by me, which is a crucial difference. The social relations have been changed. But analytically, the capitalist says, well, I have a right to a share of your income. Well, evidently, if every capitalist took a same percentage of the income, then nothing would be changed. The same amount of money would be generated by each production sector. But now we divided, let's say, 50-50 among uh, the producers who are now workers and the owners who get the other 50%. And you can see that the relative price won't be changed. There's no need for it to change because you've done a division which is simply of the same existing, under the same existing conditions. Why is this important? Because in this one step, Smith has introduced class and capitalism without having disturbed the principle of relative price. So he's established the principle that the existence of profit and the existence of private property and means of production, and later he goes on to land, same principle. The landlord can say, well, what about me? I need my 10% from every piece of income. As long as the demand made by the owners of the land and means of production are proportional to the value added, the total value added is not changed. It's just divided in different proportions, which means that, in fact, the relative prices don't have to change. And so he establishes there is nothing in the existence of capitalism, per se, which requires a change in the relative prices or deviation of relative prices from relative labor times. Okay? And Smith doesn't get further than that, except to say that that principle that every capitalist will ask for just a fraction of the value added, the same percentage in other words, is obviously not true because capitalists will say that I get uh, that uh, rather competition among capitalists will enforce that they get an equal profit rate on the value of their capital, not on the amount of labor expended in production. So that, he says, will cause a disturbance, a deviation of prices from this print rule of prices proportional to labor time. And the same thing for the landlord. The landlord is not going to ask for equal rents from equal amounts of labor, but equal rents from equal values of land. Competition will enforce that the same land will get the same rent, but then to go to the landlord. Therefore, he says, under these more general conditions, the landlord will get income relative to the value of the land owned by the landlord. The capitalist will get income relative in proportion to the value of capital, which is now privately owned means of production used to make profit, and workers will get equal wages in proportion to the labor. But that produces a different principle of price, of relative price. And Smith does not elaborate on it. He, he invents the principle, I mean, he establishes it, but he doesn't elaborate analytically on it. And this point becomes critical in Ricardo. And it's been critical from then on, the debate about whether the labor theory value holds, when you more generally, or how much it holds, and so on. Just to tell you, Ricardo is going to pick up from this point and say it's going to modify the relative determination, but not by much. So that Smith's original idea that prices are largely determined by labor time will still